So how's the family of God's people? We good? So last night I was referring to the times that we, we spent with some people who had been in the revivals in Argentina. And one of the things that they noticed when there was significant revival breakouts, when there was very strong angelic activity, it was often accompanied by these massive thunderstorms and lightnings. So I'm not sure whether we should be apologizing to the local church here or not, but they took a direct lightning strike on the building last night and knocked out a portion of the power grid here. When they arrived this morning, there was no sound. I just want to say thank you to the team for managing to get the sound back up so well. So thanks to the technical team. Thank you, guys. God is doing some powerful things. All sorts of distractions happening around the nation. There was just a wonderful circus last night. And, but we know that the Lord is doing some powerful things. Lord's given us words of hope, words of courage. So we've just decided we are a sheep nation. We're not going to be a goat nation. All right. Now, what I need for you to do is then to be prophetic in your actions. And so I'd love for you, please, to behave like sheep. When it, I'll tell you when, I'll tell you when. When you're in your car, and you're behind the steering wheel, and our parking attendants are asking you to move in a particular direction, that you don't try and run them over, like you did last night. So we had to pull the parking teams out of action because of some very dangerous situations. Please, people, pretend you're a Christian. Now live like one. Is that good? Thank you. One of the reasons why we know that God loves this nation so much is that he sends to us people who become friends. They don't just come to do ministry, but they come to share their lives and to release impartation. We are a relational people in this country. We love to do things out of relationship. And one of our dear friends has actually been adopted into the family, and that is Sean Foyt. Sean, won't you come quickly? (laughs) So we met Sean a whole bunch of years ago. It was about 2009, was it? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and he's just been coming back every year, releasing sounds of worship, intercession, music, prayer, and a heart for nations has been stirring it up. And we've just been so grateful for the way in which he's come to love us, bless us, serve us. And we'll give him an opportunity to say a few words just now in another session. But I asked him if he would come and introduce Bill because he's traveled with Bill, ministered with Bill, and has now relocated to be living in Bethel. So thank you, Sean.
Amen. Can we just give up a, just a roar of praise for all of the healings last night? On the count of three. One, two, three. When we, uh, when we got back last night, we were sitting in the, the rain and the thunder and the lightning and sharing the testimonies of all that God had done last night while cutting into a prime piece of rare South African steak. <laughs> and uh, Bill turned and looked to me and he goes, I really like this place. <laughs> so... Um, no, I just, I honestly feel it's such a historic moment for this nation, and I just feel so um, humbled and privileged to be even just a small part of it, and, you know, I was thinking about some of the areas, or, or one of the biggest, I feel like, that's being imparted from his life over this nation, and I was, you know, reminded of when I grew up, um, like, I had a really good father, and Really good fathers don't tell their sons to not get their hopes up. Even though my dad was a doctor and he was in the medical field and he's a medical missionary and he never had the expectation that I had to follow in his exact footsteps and do it like he did. And he never, ever squashed the hope and the expectation that was in my heart to do great things. And there was a permission given and I feel like that with this trip of Bill being here, there's a massive permission that's being granted. And I feel like even today, and, and I'm gonna introduce him, I feel like that there is, that this nation is getting pumped full of perpetual optimism. And I know things are crazy here and I know not everyone's happy and I know the political climate's whatever and I know the RAND is whatever and I know that there are a lot of issues, but this is a day when God has sent us a father to come and remind us, hey, it's time to get your hopes up. It's time to get your hopes up. I want to read this quote by Mandela. He said, I am fundamentally an optimist. Whether that comes from nature or nurture, I cannot say. Part of being an optimist is keeping one's head pointed towards the sun one's feet moving forward. Another quote about optimism, it says, pessimism leads to weakness and optimism leads to power. Helen Keller said, optimism is the faith that leads to achievement. Nothing can be done without hope and confidence. So I just feel like this morning and this weekend, we are just getting totally filled with the perpetual optimism that this man carries in his family. And I've had the privilege to know them for many years, and I'm telling you, it's the real deal. Through trial, through everything, they carry such an optimism that God can show up at any time in any way, and the impossible can be made possible. So let's stand to our feet, and let's just welcome that as a nation. Come on, let's just thank God for this father of optimism, this father of hope. Thanks, thanks, thanks. You're nice. You're nice. Yes, indeed, we had red meat last night. Yeah, in fact, we had red meat all day yesterday. I, I love your snack tables. You can't have one without beef. You know, there's nuts, there's candy, and there's beef. It's like... Somebody gave me this t-shirt that said, if God meant for us to be vegetarians, broccoli would be more fun to shoot at. <laughs> it's, it's one of the best prophetic words I've ever heard. Was that, that was a great word. <laughs> uh, we have quite a few vegetarians in our church, and I don't know how, I don't even know why they stay, because <laughs> I, mean, I, I tease them so much, and, but it's, it's this love thing, so, the 
there's a there's a saying in our area. Uh, vegetarian is the Native American's word for bad hunter. young businesswoman flushed with success was opening a new branch office and a friend decided to send a floral arrangement for the grand opening. When he arrived at the opening, he was appalled to find that his wreath bore the inscription, rest in peace. <laughs> Angrily, he complained to the florist. After apologizing, the florist said, well, look at it this way. Somewhere a man was buried under a wreath that said, good luck in your new location. <laughs> who had been a retired farmer for a long time, became very bored, decided to open a medical clinic. He put a sign up outside that said, Dr. Geezer's Clinic, get your treatment for $500. If you're not cured, you get back $1,000. Dr. Young, who was a legitimate doctor, thought this would be a great chance to make $1,000, and he knew this old geezer didn't know anything about medicine. So he went to the clinic, and this is what happened. Dr. Young walks in, Dr. Geezer, I've lost all the taste in my mouth. Can you please help me? Dr. Geezer turns to a nurse, and he says, please bring medicine from box 22, put three drops on Dr. Dr. Young's tongue. Dr. Young screams out, that's gasoline. Dr. Geezer says, congratulations, you've got your taste back. <clears throat> That'll be $500. <laughs> Dr. Young gets angry. He goes back after a couple of days trying to figure out how to get his money back. And he walks in and he says, I've lost all my memory. I cannot remember anything. Dr. Geezer turns to the nurse and says, please bring medicine from box 22. Put three drops in the patient's mouth. Dr. Young yells out, oh, no, you don't. That's gasoline. Congratulations. You've got your memory back. That'll be $500. <laughs> Dr. Young, having lost $1,000, leaves angrily, and he comes back after several more days. He walks in, he says, my eyesight has become weak. I can hardly see. Dr. Geezer says, well, I don't have any medicine for that, so here's your $1,000 back. Dr. Young looks at it and says, hey, this is only $500. Congratulations, you've got your vision back. <laughs> That'll be $500. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's so funny. I read those for my sake. You can, you can enjoy them if you'd like. We've got a bunch, of, we've got a book table somewhere. Um, we have a, quite a few. Uh, curriculums that we've uh, made out of books that I've written. I wrote a book a while back on strengthening yourself in the Lord. Basically works on this premise that David, who was rejected by Saul's household, was rejected by his own brethren. They were going to turn him over to Saul, who was uh, seeking to kill him. He went and hid among the Philistines. The Philistines uh, at one point rejected him. It's bad when the devil rejects you. <clears throat> It's a bad joke, but it was a joke. <clears throat> and then finally, his own men turned on him, and they were going to kill him because they lost their wives, their kids, all their possessions. And in his darkest moment, he strengthened himself in the Lord, and the next scene, he becomes king. I don't think it's possible for us to come into our destiny in the Lord without learning how to minister to ourselves. It's a huge, it's a huge part of God's process. He'll actually blind the eyes, deafen the ears of your closest friends to your heart's cry 
to force you to a place where you learn how to minister to yourself. Not out of independence, but just out of basic um, I- embracing the strength that the Lord has provided for us. So anyway, um, it was finally been made into a curriculum. There's DVD, uh, a series in here with the workbooks, that sort of thing. So that's available <clears throat> wherever books are sold, <clears throat> somewhere out there. My wife's latest book is called Healthy and Free. And uh, she does just, she has this amazing grace on her life to uh, minister to people, spirit, soul, and body. And she leads people in really healthy lifestyles. And she deals with those three realms of spiritual health, emotional, mental health, and physical. And she she works hard to raise up a bunch of people. So that's available out there. Um, Randy Clark and I have done a couple books together. Randy Clark is one of my closest friends and a real hero in the faith. Uh, The Lord used him to ignite the revival fires in Toronto back in January of 94. And uh, one of the books that uh, Randy and I did, we actually have, we interviewed each other uh, for over four hours each. <clears throat> and uh, we did it for his, uh, for his school, a DVD to be able to pass on to his students. And, um, and it just turned out really good. And some, I think he had the idea of taking a transcript, making a book out of it. And um, I didn't know if that'd be a very good idea. I read through the transcript, and you just get stuff. This is what that book is. It's uh, where we ask each other questions about our journey in, in Miracle Signs and Wonders. It's called Anointed to Heal. It's a re-release. Uh, the former title was Healing Unplugged. So if you bought that one, don't get this one, because it's the same. But uh, it's, uh, I think it's fascinating. I think you'll find it worth your while. It's out there. It's called Anointed to Heal. And uh, you just find some things covered in that book that are not typically covered. Um, it was very, very fun for me. Um, <clears throat> the last book I'll mention uh, this morning is called The Power That Changes the World. Um, there's, <clears throat> in my background, the primary m- focus was the go of the gospel. You go into all the world, preach the gospel. A missionary movement, uh, going out on the streets, evangelizing, the go of the gospel but sometimes at the expense of the come of the gospel. We are to become something that people would come to in the same way that you go to a shade tree to get shade, in the same way that you go to a stream to get water. Uh, So the people of God are to become something that lost people would come to. That's why he says you're a city set on a hill. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. The city doesn't move. People go to the city to find safety to find uh, shelter, etc., And so there's that aspect of the gospel, and this deals with the wisdom part of the gospel that is, enables us to get into the world system and to serve there. Um, the Bible says we're the salt of the earth. I always thought that that was, um, it meant we were to preserve things because of our righteous stands and our voting and our whatever. That's a secondary implication. Salt actually adds f- flavor, and what we're supposed to do is add flavor to our cities. It's actually, we're supposed to enhance the nature of God that is already written into the DNA of our cities and our nations. And uh, it just takes a little bit different approach. That one's available back there. And then we've got some flash drives. They're pretty cool. <clears throat> they have a bunch of messages on them. Even if you never listen to them, you just feel better about yourself because they look so cool. <laughs> That's pitiful, I know. <clears throat> uh, there's, uh, this one's called the Healing uh, Collection. The first two messages on here are uh, Enduring Faith is the week before and the week after my dad died. And it's how do, you, how do you maintain a focus on call, on the purpose of the Lord to bring deliverance and healing to people when you've suffered disappointment and loss, things you can't explain, things you cannot control. And uh, so that uh, is probably the two most important messages I've done in my life. And uh, it's on that series. And uh, I think it's about 15, 16, maybe 17 messages on here. Another one's called Keys to Promotion. Uh, it's the same kind of thing. It's just bringing people into their places of strength. We have another one back there. It's called the Revival Series. It has, oh! I'm going through puberty. I, my voice just changed. <coughs> I feel the same. It's just... <coughs> That's pitiful, isn't it? Uh, This one uh, is uh, Keys to Promotion. 
uh, one of the series that's in this is um, Keys to Longevity. And one of the things that's of great, great uh, concern or part of my uh, core value for me is I, I don't want to just do well for a season. I want to do well for a lifetime. I want to I want to get better, better walking, greater purity, greater authority, etc. Throughout my life. And so, uh, I'm a fifth generation pastor on my my dad's side of the family, fourth on my mom's. My kids now are the sixth generation, and our interest is in creating a momentum that um, uh, that can be duplicated. And uh, so anyway, that's back there. And uh, I started to mention the revival series. It's got everything that we've got is on one flash drive. It's 180 some messages. It's basically enough to kill you. So <clears throat> that's out there somewhere. Anybody have a birthday today? Come here. If you have a birthday today, come on up here. Anybody else? Come on down. Just, just pick one. Pick, 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 pick. Beautiful. Bless you. Enjoy it. Happy birthday. Which, which one? Which one do you want? Promotion or healing? Promotion. All right. Which one would you like? Beautiful. All right. It's beautiful. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Healthy and free. Who's just horribly out of shape and you want to get your act together? All right. Just, just <laughs> the wife is pointing. Oh, oh. <laughs> right. oh. You are. You ran up here. All right. Is there... Um, uh, I want to give this to, is there, is there a pastor who has planted a church in the last year? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. All right. All right. Sorry. There we go. Sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Wow. I have to pray for inner healing for all those that... Okay, you ready to get going here? Let's see what time... Yeah, good. <clears throat> the Lord doesn't entertain us until he returns to take us home. He's actually building something in us. He's enabling us to be a people who have understanding. Um, he wants us to know what his world is like. He wants us to know what he's like. Moses prayed this prayer. He said, let me know your ways that I might know you. Moses knew that with every revelation of God's nature, he would then pursue God in that area. Let me explain this. There's a misconception that where people think that because they understand a truth, they have the anointing to live that truth. And it, it really doesn't work that way. A revelation is an invitation for encounter so that we can display the reality of that truth. A revelation. <laughs> Whenever the Lord unveils truth to us, it always is an invitation for encounter so that we can be one who models, displays, illustrates that truth. For example, not er uh, 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 there's still a segment of the body of Christ that doesn't believe in healing for today. Thankfully, that number is diminishing because it, it's just spreading so wonderfully. But if those who believed in healing demonstrated healing, there would no longer be a part of the body that didn't believe in healing. We're supposed to pursue encounter according to the revelation received. Let me illustrate this for you biblically. Paul, in his letter to uh, the Corinthians, the Corinth, church at Corinth, he opens up a, a revelation to them about the gifts of the Spirit. And so we have in 1 Corinthians 12, we have this 
not only list of gifts of the Spirit, how they function, their role, and he brings to this body of believers a profound new revelation, new insight on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But in chapter 14, he says, pursue earnestly spiritual gifts. So what happened? We have in chapter 12, the revelation of the gift, but in chapter 14, pursuing the anointing to be able to demonstrate or illustrate the gift. They don't come together. Does that make sense? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? They don't come together. And so, and if we can, if we can learn this kind of a, uh, this kind of a weakness in, in most of those who have Western rational uh, approach to theology, uh, we'll save ourselves a lot of heartache because um, revelation is an invitation for encounter. And it's the encounter that makes us able to illustrate and demonstrate the reality of, of what God says. Yes, amen. <laughs> Authority comes in the commission. Power comes in the encounter. Yes. All right. So the Lord is building in us an understanding of what his world is like, what his nature is like. And oftentimes when he begins to work with us in understanding, he will liken the kingdom of God to something in nature that we relate to. He'll illustrate, for example, I mentioned to you last night, sowing and reaping. If you plant corn, you harvest corn. If you plant a, you know, a cherry tree, you're going to eventually harvest cherries. The, the whole point is reaping and sowing. Well, that's a part of the kingdom of God as well. Those who display mercy will harvest mercy. Blessed are the merciful, they shall receive mercy. So what he's doing is he's illustrating the nature of his world to us. But he's linking it to nature. He's linking it to things that we, that we know and understand. Why? Because he's trying to create a foundation so that he can add to our understanding of what his world is like. And I want to show you one particular portion of Scripture, John chapter 3, if you turn there. One particular portion of Scripture where he, he, actually, he actually takes the disciples, the crowd that's with him, he takes them on a journey to learn about the kingdom of God. And he takes them through this, this process that I think is, is wonderful. When the, does this make sense to you that there are different dimensions of truth? There are things that are true, but then there are things that are more true. Sin is a reality. The destructiveness of sin is true. Is that right? Love covers a multitude of sin. It's, it's a superior revelation. It doesn't mean you ignore the first one. It's that inferior is the wrong word. Uh, beginning places of understanding they become foundational for the things God wants to add. Does that make sense? Here's another one. I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. So as how many of you are a friend of God? Did you stop serving when you became a friend? No. Because a new revelation doesn't abolish the previous. Right? It doesn't abolish it. It just, what it does is it creates a context in which servanthood now is lived out in the context of friendship. Right? And so the Lord's wanting to build something in us because we have this responsibility to bind here what's bound there and to loose here what's loose there. We can't loose here unless we have understanding of what's happening there. All right. <clears throat> Let's just get into it and see if this works. If it doesn't, I have more jokes. <clears throat> Verse 1 of chapter 3, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man, to came, uh, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God because no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Stop right there. Rabbi, we know you're a teacher come from God for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. In many of our cultures, and I'm assuming it's going to be true here in South Africa, in many of our culture, the teaching gift has been reduced to a person who gives knowledge. And it was never meant to be that way. You could, 
you could probably go to a business school in your nation as you can mine and go through school and be taught by people who train you in business and they never themselves have ever owned a business because our cultures elevate knowledge above experience. And there are very key words throughout the Bible that emphasize the fact that knowledge is supposed to be experiential. He says, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. There's a contradictory statement, a verse in Ephesians chapter 3. I think it's verse 19. He says, to know by experience what is beyond comprehension. He's inviting us into an experiential role. I understand the, the weakness is that you elevate your emotional experience above the revelation of Scripture. That would be absolutely wrong. But it's equally in error to elevate knowledge to the place where it replaces experience. There's a thought that our intellect in and of itself can perfect, protect us from deception. I would like to suggest that that in itself is deception. God is not a philosophy. He's a person to be known. Not exhausted in knowing. Not comprehended. But known. My heart can take me places my head can't fit. And when we, when we follow this passion for the Lord and learn by relationship that experience in God begins to give us understanding and perception. <clears throat> so here Nicodemus says, we know you're a teacher, <clears throat> excuse me, come from God, because no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. <clears throat> I've made it a personal uh, journey uh, for a number of years. To Every time I find uh, we're doing and teaching, the working of miracles and teaching are in the same breath to mark that in my Bible. Because I want to emphasize that that is the teaching role in the scripture. And it doesn't mean if you're a Bible teacher, you have to end every session with a miracle service. But it does mean that the teaching of the word is supposed to open people's hearts for what only God can do. That's the point. We teach either to explain what just happened or what's about to happen. And that's the whole point, is we are a part of a supernatural world that is constantly active among us. And the teaching role is supposed to open that so we can perceive and understand. Amen. All right. Move on to verse 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Your conversion gave you the capacity to see. The kingdom of God is unseen. So conversion gives us the capacity to see the unseen. And don't tell me you don't hear God's voice because you couldn't be saved otherwise. He called you to himself. You heard it and said yes. All right. <clears throat> You're making me work hard this morning, but it's all right. I... I'm going to still work hard. Verse 4, Nicodemus said, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, which is natural birth, and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. All right, hopefully this will make sense in a moment. <clears throat> Nicodemus answered, verse 9, says, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher in Israel and you don't know these things? I love that. That's... Na, 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 na. <clears throat> This is a puzzling verse, verse 11. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know. We testify what we have seen. You do not receive our witness. Who's we? It's not him and the angels. It's not Jesus and the disciples. It's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He says, we speak what we know. We testify to what we have seen. Growing up, uh, my grandparents, my mom's parents lived with us a good part of my life. 
and uh, I come from, uh, uh, from that side of the family, was especially involved in hunting. And I, I love to look at the pictures of my grandfather, and I love to hear the stories of his hunting dog named Joe, and uh, how they would hunt and they'd fish, they were from Minnesota. And uh, those stories were just a part of my upbringing. They were part of my inheritance. They helped me to see where I came from. They helped me to see, to learn about my Norwegian side of the family. And it was just, it was all their stories. They were testifying to me what they had experienced. My grandfather actually uh, sat under the ministry of Wigglesworth for a season. And um, my uncle was a soloist for Amy Simple McPherson. So I loved uh, sitting and just hearing the stories. That's part of my heritage. And what they were doing is they were describing to me what they had experienced that I was going to benefit from. And whether it was hunting or healing, they're both a part of the kingdom. <laughs> just thought I'd throw that in. I can't throw that in everywhere, but I can here. Jesus is saying, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we've seen some things we'd like to tell you about. But he says, nobody receives our witness. He'd like to describe to someone the highway from heaven to earth where the Holy Spirit was released on the day of Pentecost. And how a room could be filled with fire and with wind. He's just describing heaven. Hebrews 1, referring to angels who makes his ministers, his angels, wind and fire. He'd love to describe some of that to someone, but it's been hard for him to find anyone who would receive the witness. It's our family stories. It's our inheritance. I'm not saying in addition to Scripture. I'm just saying... It's here, but we don't see it. Verse 12. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Okay, stop for a moment. <clears throat> this is the verse I wanted to get to, and then we're going to try to build from here. He says, Jesus says, if I tell you earthly things and you don't make the connection, how can I tell you about heavenly things? Let's walk through this. If I tell you, if I talk to you about earthly things, you don't make the connection. What is he referring to? He's referring to born again. He uses birth as an illustration of conversion. Yes? Being born, that's natural. And then he uses wind, the nature of wind. Don't know where it's coming from, don't know where it's going. And he describes that. He uses that as an illustration of the born again person's life. And so he uses birth and wind to illustrate our salvation. And then he says, if I talk to you about natural things and you don't make the connection, how can I talk to you about heavenly things? What is he saying? If you don't get it when I talk to you about the natural realm, how can I talk to you about my world, the part that has no earthly parallel? Because that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to build... He's trying to connect the dots for us so that we see uh, conversion is like birth, the nature of a believer is like wind, um, sowing and reaping. If you give mercy, you're going to receive mercy. He's working with us on these, on these concepts that are tied to nature. But you can tell where his heart is. His heart is to expose to us realities of his world that we have no reference for. He said this in John 16. He said, he says, I have so many things to tell you but you cannot bear them now. See, whenever Jesus spoke, he would release a new reality over the people he spoke to. And they didn't have the strength, they didn't have the weight-carrying capacity for the glory that would have been released had he talked to them about what he wanted to say. So I, 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 I can feel this uh, over my life, over your life, where the Lord frequently is wanting to tell us more than we have the capacity to carry. See, he wants to release things over us that we can carry well because then it promotes us. But if he prematurely gives us the weighty things of heaven, then what was supposed to promote us actually crushes us. 
And so the Lord is looking for people that aren't just curious, that don't, don't just want to grow in knowledge, but actually want to grow in, in the knowledge of the Lord in the same measure that they grow in purity, in absolute devotion to Christ. It is all about walking in purity and power. Those are the two legs that we stand on, is purity and power. And those two legs are supposed to be the same length. I had somebody tell me once, well, when, I, when I'm walking in greater purity, then I'll start praying for the sick. Sounds good. I asked him, who gave you the right to decide when you're going to obey God? How do you become more pure by not paying attention to what he commanded you to do? Yeah, it went over well then, too. <clears throat> so he says, if I tell you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? So here's the deal. Sowing and reaping, brilliant part of the kingdom. It's a brilliant part of kingdom finances. But it's not the ultimate truth in kingdom finances. Because in this world of sowing and reaping, you receive according to what you've done. The law of blessing is greater than that because we receive according to what he's done. But you don't start with the law of blessing. You start with sowing and reaping. You have to start with the basic elements of the kingdom of God. And then he wants to take us from there to give us understanding of how his world actually functions. Why? Because our job is to release here what's released there. Remember, the scripture not only says that the earth would be filled with the glory of the Lord, but it says the earth would be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. That there would be a generation that would understand, understand again, not in a, in a sense of absolute full comprehension, because throughout eternity we're going to be learning. We know that's true. Just take one subject, the grace of God. Look at Ephesians 2. It says, in the ages to come, we will be discovering the surpassing greatness, the surpassing riches of his grace. What does that mean? It means as much as you may know about grace now in your first thousand years in heaven, you're only going to be just starting to understand grace. And all of eternity, you'll be exploring this great realm called the grace of God. Heaven is a very industrious place. It's a place where there's extreme learning, where we, we learn, we behold, we see, we become. There's this transformational thing that takes place in the presence. We are actually transformed in the glory more than any other realm. The gifts and graces that you function by here on earth, you will function by in heaven. They'll just be more expanded, more perfected. And while we're on earth, we have a responsibility. I know some translations say bind here on earth and it will be bound in heaven. You can't bind in time and then have it bound in eternity. You can only bind here what's already been bound there. You loose here what's been loose there. We know what to bind because we, we're familiar with the works of the devil, right? I mean, we, that's not a complicated one. The devil came to kill, steal, destroy. So wherever there's death, loss, and destruction, that's the fingerprints of the devil. We know what to bind. To bind is to hold to a contract. If you buy a car, decide not to make the payments, the bank will say, we're going to hold you, we're going to bind you to the contract. You owe us this much every month. Either that or we take the car away. So what do we do when we bind the enemy? We bind him to the contract that says, God said, I will trample on all the powers of hell. God says that in his name I have authority over all the powers of darkness. So I'm holding that en the enemy to this contract declared by the Lord over my life. Right? So we know what to bind because we know what death, loss, and destruction looks like. But we don't always know what to lose. I'm supposed to release here what's released there. But if we have very little knowledge of his world, we don't know what to replace When you take something away, you have to replace it. 
Are you guys all right? I, I, I'm, I know I'm bouncing around perhaps a little bit too much here, but just work with me and I'll, I'll see if we can have a happy landing. Try not to crash this plane in the side of a mountain. <clears throat> the, Lord, the Lord is giving us glimpses of his world so that we can replace what was taken away. Uh, here's a good example. Do you remember where Jesus said there was a house that was clean and swept? The, the, the previous resident, the enemy came back. He saw nothing, no furniture, nothing put back in the house. So he came back seven times worse. What is that describing? It's describing a life that was cleaned out but was, but was never refilled with the right things. Does that make sense? In some ways, that's a binding, loosing reality. It's one thing to bind the devil. It's another to replace with kingdom understanding and experience. So verse 13 is Jesus reveals what I believe to be an absolute key to his life and ministry on earth. He said, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. Okay, now think with me. No one has ascended. All right, we know that Jesus, when he died, he was resurrected. We know he ascended to the right hand of the Father. We know he was glorified, right? But this is while he's still son of man, not yet sacrificed for our sin. This is early in the Gospel of John. This is early in his time of earthly ministry. And he says in that context, nobody has ascended with the exception of one person referring to himself. That is the Son of Man who is in heaven. He's, he's illustrating something that's mind-boggling. He's, he's describing to us, he says, I know you see me standing on earth, but I want you to know I live from heaven towards earth. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul would later fi find language for this truth when he taught us that we are seated in heavenly places in Christ. Tragically, that's become a doctrine, not an experience. It's supposed to be when God reveals truth to us, we pursue the experience so that when we talk about a subject, we actually can speak with authority, not just ideas. Yeah. Teaching out of concepts, principles, ideas, not experience, is not illegal. You just have to understand it's inferior. Sometimes we'll discuss things because we can see where we're going. We don't know what it entails yet, but we discuss things ahead of time. Just be honest enough. So he says, no one has ascended to heaven except he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. He's illustrating to us how it is to live, how was it he was able to know what the father was doing? Remember, he'd only do what he saw the father do, he would only say what he heard the father say. It's because of this ascended lifestyle while living on planet earth. One of the old saints called it the throne life. It's living from the throne of God towards life. Probably for most people in this room, at least historically, our prayer life is something like this. We are in the middle of a problem, a conflict here on earth. We cry out to God in heaven, ask him to come and fix this problem that we're facing. Jesus never asked the Father to come and heal anyone. I can't find it happening anywhere because he was living in ascended place in the Father. And so he knew the heart of the Father and he would represent the heart of the Father as he ministered to that sick person. I don't, I don't believe, I don't believe, thank you. I don't believe that Jesus automatically always knew what the Father was doing, just an, an opinion, and let me illustrate it. He comes to the Syrophoenician woman. The woman says, please heal, bring deliverance to my daughter. And Jesus said, I can't give the children's bread to dogs. What is, what is he saying? He's saying, he's already told his disciples, don't minister to the Gentiles. 
only minister to the Jews. Why? We were sent to minister to the Jews. In the rejection by the Jews, the gospel goes to the Gentiles. You understand that, right? Okay. So now Jesus is talking to the Syrophoenician woman. And he's already been instructed. You are sent to the Jews. So what does he do? He tells her, I can't give the children's bread to dogs. She said, but even the dogs get the crumbs from the table. Jesus looks at this woman and he sees a faith in her eyes that she couldn't get anywhere but from the Father. And he knew what the Father was doing. So in the ascended life, you have a sense for what the Lord is doing. You don't always know the will of God, but you know how to recognize the signs of his working. It's a lot more fun to live from heaven towards earth than it is trying to beg heaven to invade earth, if that makes any sense, all right? <clears throat> so, what we have, uh, the Gospel of John illustrates this concept that I'm trying to lay out here really well. And so we go to chapter 4, and we go to, um, in chapter 4 of John, we have what I believe to be the greatest instruction, the greatest insight in the Bible on worship. And that is those who worship God worship in spirit and in truth. In spirit is with the work of the Holy Spirit. In truth means nothing hidden. And worship is an absolute abandonment to the purposes of God led and directed by the Holy Spirit himself. And that's not the subject, but the greatest passage in the Bible on worship is followed by the greatest passage in the Bible on evangelism. And I don't think it's an accident because evangelism in its purest form is an overflow of worship. The verse that you're familiar with on evangelism here in chapter 4 is verse 35. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes, look at the fields. They are already white for harvest. How many of you remember that verse? That's, you ought to read your Bibles more because that that's in there. How many of you remember that verse? Yes, a few more of you. That's good. He said, you say it takes four months. Can I just think with me now? He says, you say it takes four months, and then comes the harvest. Where did they get that knowledge? From the crops. That's how it worked. They planted. Four months later, they get a harvest. So what is Jesus doing? Remember earlier, he, he started them in their learning about the kingdom with natural laws, natural principles that would reveal the nature of the kingdom. Yes? But the natural laws never restrict or limit. They are only building blocks. Does that make sense? So now he comes along and he pulls out a new lesson. He says, you say it takes four months. And you can just imagine her going, <laughs> yeah, we say it takes four months because it takes four months. And Jesus says, lift up your eyes. In other words, look up before you look down. Lift up your eyes. Look on the fields. They're all white for harvest. That's just interesting. Because he's describing the fact that every person is harvestable now. I'm going to add um, a qualification. Every person is harvestable now if you have an anointing that is equal to their bondage. If the anointing that you carry, remember, he reveals about the gifts of the Spirit, and then he says, seek earnestly, pursue passionately, lustfully pursue spiritual gifts. In other words, you see how they function. Now, pursue the encounter so that you can display the reality of these gifts. So now what is he doing? He's introducing his disciples to a concept that is absolutely extreme, that everyone is, is harvestable now. Is that what he's saying? Lift up your eyes, look on the fields, they are all white for harvest. In another place, Luke 16, verse 16, Jesus says, something. <laughs> he 
He said, up till now, the law and the prophets were until John, referring to John the Baptist. The law and the prophets were until John. And then he says, but since that time, the kingdom of God is being preached, listen to the phrase, and everyone is pressing their way into it. Law and prophets till John. John started a new message. Jesus carried it on. The kingdom is preached and everyone is pressing their way into it. Is it possible that the size of the harvest is determined by the nature of the message? When we change the message from the message of the kingdom to our version of it, then we have small harvest. One more concept on this harvest thing, then I got to get back to this story. When Jesus introduced Peter to the concept of he was going to make him a fisher of men. Do you remember the story? It's in Luke chapter 5. Jesus tells Peter to put the net out again, which they had done all night long. His, nets are, his net is bursting. There's so many fish. He calls another boat. Both boats begin to sink. And in this context of two boats sinking because of too many fish, Jesus says, from now on you'll be catching men. Fish. So what is the picture branded into Peter's mind of the harvest? It's a harvest bigger than any of us can possibly contain. I don't believe in universalism where everybody ends up in heaven. I think that's, I think that's a horrible lie. But I do believe the harvest is going to be bigger than we've ever imagined in our lifetime. And we've got to gear up for it. We've got to be ready. So let's get back to this concept here. He says, lift up your eyes, look around you, see. He said, all, all the fields are white under harvest. The two greatest conversions, in my estimation, in the Bible are Nebuchadnezzar in the Old Testament. Stunning story how Daniel won over this man's heart through loyalty in perhaps the most ungodly environment anyone has ever known. Daniel, through his loyalty to this man, in the midst of absolute corruption and evil, a demonic empire, Daniel served in it prophetically and won the heart of that king where his final words were giving praise to the Almighty God. Stunning, stunning conversion. The one that I would put in equal to that one would be the conversion of the man of the Gadarenes. I just, I just love the story. I love, if you can imagine, the disciples are in a boat with Jesus. It just seems to me every time they got in a boat, they had problems. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. It probably wasn't legal, but I think I would be inclined to say, Jesus, I'll take the horse around the lake. <laughs> I'll meet you on the other side. Us and boats don't get along well. So the disciples are in one of those journeys. They're going across the sea. They about die at sea again. And uh, Jesus saves the day, and they find themselves literally translated to the edge of the shore. They get out of the boat. You can imagine they're kissing the planet, <laughs> dry ground, and they're just they're thankful to be alive. And here he comes, the man of the Gadarenes, the man who is so tormented that his demons are possessed. <clears throat> He's got, <laughs> he's got way too many birds on his antenna, if you know what I mean. He's, every place he goes, he gets a group discount. <laughs> the guy has a life subscription, lifetime subscription to issues. So, so here he comes. Here's the guy who, you know, rips his clothes off, breaks chains, you know, howls at night, eats their cats and dogs, all that sort of stuff. <laughs> so here he comes. Here's, here's this bizarre story. Here's this guy. They can't even chain up at night. He's so demonized. They can't even chain him up because he just breaks the chains. And you can see the disciples. They, they're just glad to be alive. They get out. They're just thankful to be on stable ground. <laughs> 
and they look up and here, here it comes. And this, this guy who is, he's got, a, he's got a boatload of demons on him, you know. He's, you know, when he gets set free, 2,000 pigs go commit suicide. They, they run into the sea, you know, deviled ham. They run right into the sea. I know, that's bad. And, they, and, they, and the whole economy, you know, went belly up in that uh, experience. So we don't know how many demons he had, but let's just say for illustration's sake, one per pig, so 2,000. <clears throat> so here's this guy. He comes running at Jesus. And you can imagine the disciples, you know, John turns to Peter and says, you take him high, I'll take him low. We're, we've got, we've got to pr protect the master. And here's this guy. He's got this boatload of demons. He runs at Jesus, and then it says he falls before him and worships. Now listen, this is before his deliverance. If 2,000 demons cannot keep one man from worshiping Jesus, if 2,000 demons cannot keep one man from worshiping Jesus, the church has no excuse. No excuse. This man falls before Jesus and worships him. Jesus turns to the man and brings him into his one-step program. <laughs> Out of darkness into his marvelous light. One step. Now, if it takes 12 steps or 100 steps, I don't care, let's just get people free. But the amount of steps is usually determined by the measure of anointing we live in. Just use whatever measure you have, let's get people free. But just realize that perhaps the most tormented person in the Bible was free in one step. When Jesus touches a person, he doesn't just touch them in one area. You remember the man at the gate who was healed? It says he was walking, he was leaping, he was praising God. He was walking because he was physically healed. He was leaping because he was emotionally healed. He was praising God because he was spiritually healed. <clears throat> when the Lord touches people, and we have to be sensitive to this, he's always wanting to go beyond the obvious and re redirect the passions, the affections of a person's life. <clears throat> so here's this guy. He falls before Jesus. Jesus leads him into this massive deliverance. The pigs go kill themselves. <clears throat> and now the town shows up. And one of the funniest verses in the Bible <clears throat> says, this demonized man is now free. It says, he's clothed, which means he wasn't. <clears throat> he's clothed and in his right mind, and the city was afraid. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. You know, as long as he's tormented, he just does what he does. That's just the way George is. You know, his, his dad was the same way. We just, you just make accommodations. <clears throat> but once God shows up in church and demonstrates power, people become afraid. You know, if you don't run into the devil now and then, you might be going the same direction. So here's this verse, it says, he's clothed and in his right mind, and the city's afraid. So the, the city is absolutely terrified. As long as there's no power in the church, nobody's nervous. Power forces a decision. In Luke 5, I already mentioned a story to you when <clears throat> Peter, Jesus, gets in the boat and he's preaching to a crowd on the shore. Water conducts sound uh, impressively. So he backs off and it, it amplifies sound so he can communicate to a large crowd. 
And so when he's through giving his message to the crowd, he turns to Peter and says, go out into the deep and cast your net out. Peter says, we did it all night, but at your word, I'll do it again. That's when he gets this uh, huge harvest. Here's the, here's the part that you may have missed. As soon as the, the boats are filled with fish, Peter drops to his knees and he says, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. What sermon did Jesus preach on repentance there? He didn't. He just did a miracle. See, miracle, miracles force a decision. Power forces a decision. Some will vote for, some will vote against. As long as you and I do what is humanly possible to care for people, the world will applaud you. But when you, when you start moving in power, you have some support you and some will work against you because that's the nature of power. Power forces a decision. And Peter drops to his knees and begins to repent. Why? Power does that. It just brings things to the surface. The insecurities of people's lives, the need to understand and control, all of that goes out the window when you start seeing things happen outside of your frame of reference. <clears throat> so this guy's clothed in his right mind, the city's afraid. So what do they do? They chase Jesus, the disciples, and this guy out of town. So you can imagine, they're all leaving. They're all leaving. You know, imagine you're, you're the disciples and uh, you're writing your missions letter for that month. And here, here's how it went. We almost died at sea. We landed in the new missionary assignment. We have one questionable convert. And we got chased out of town. Please send money. <laughs> Not the most successful missionary journey is what I'm trying to describe. So here's the disciples and Jesus being chased out of town. Here's the brand new convert. You know, how long has the guy been saved? Like an hour. All right. So he's run alongside with Jesus. He goes, you and me. You and me. Those people are weird. Those people are weird. <laughs> Those, those people have issues. I'm with you. And Jesus says, you can't come. Now, just, just think with me now. Jesus is telling the brand new convert, the guy who needs some help, the guy that if he were to get saved in most of our churches would get counseling for the next 15 years, so that we could be certain he could direct traffic in the parking lot. <laughs> so here Jesus says, you can't come. And you can just imagine the disciples are going, you know, we ought to maybe make an exception this one time. <laughs> you know, this, we, we saw this guy naked and, and now he's not and it might be good. Jesus says, you can't come. He says, go back and tell them all the great things I've done for you. Well, that looks really cool on paper. How many sermons does he have? <laughs> One, uh, I was the naked guy. Uh, <clears throat> uh, sorry about your cats and dogs. <laughs> <laughs> That was done in poor taste. <laughs> he's got, he's got, he's got one, one message. One, one story. And so Jesus sends him back as the chairman of the Jesus Christ Evangelistic Association <laughs> for that region, because he's actually the only convert there, so he's the president. The vice president, the treasurer, he's in charge of everything. He sends him back to this area that Jesus got chased out of. And the next time Jesus comes back to that region, the Bible says, every person from every village came to hear him speak. <clears throat> Jesus is illustrating 
the fields are all white to harvest. Get alone with God. Deepen the encounter with him so that these things that come our way we're as prepared for as we know how to be. We seek for the anointing that's equal to the harvest. Stand. Let's just stand. frequently asked about lifestyle of miracles, that sort of thing, how to increase in it. There's a a lot of things that I try to answer with, but it basically comes down to this. In private, cry out to God. In public, take risk. If the risk works, give him all the credit. If it doesn't, get back into the secret place, cry out to God. We don't have the option to live without power. It's not optional. He said, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devil, cleanse leper. I don't know if it stands out to you, but he didn't even say pray for the sick. He said, heal the sick. (laughs) Well, Bill, you don't heal the sick. We pray he heals the sick. I know that. That's just not what he said. (laughs) Take ownership of the responsibility and do the best you know how to bring that, that about. If you try over and over and over again, doesn't work, get back into the secret place and cry out to God. The whole point is, is we're wanting him to demonstrate who he is through us. There's something about this invitation to see the harvest from his perspective. Look up, lift your eyes, look on the field. Because if we can see the harvest the way he sees the harvest, we'll cry out in the secret place for the greater anointing to bring in the harvest that he is worthy of. The Moravians had that famous saying, to win for the lamb the reward of his suffering. Psalms 22 is oftentimes referred to as a messianic psalm because of so many references in the psalm to the cross, the crucifixion. <clears throat> and the very end of the psalm has nations coming to him, bowing before him. It's too easy in present theological environments to assume when he refers to nations bowing before him, that's in the millennium sounds to me it's the kind of harvest he expects to get with boats loaded with fish that he sent us to disciple nations that wasn't a figure of speech it was a commission a command so here's here's the deal in public we take the risk we look for the opportunity we look for the problem the point of pain the point of loss the point of need in private we cry out for more and it's back and forth back and forth. It's not one or the other. It's back and forth. I saw a quote by Reinhard Bonnke two weeks ago. It says, 
Those who are constantly seeking for the will of God are run over by those who are doing it. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> start with just a couple minutes of prayer and I want you to bring before him what you hunger for. It could be something I didn't even talk about, obviously. I maybe open something up for you that you would cry out for. But I'm going to ask you to pray. And I'm going to ask you to pray out loud. I'm not asking you to be loud. I'm just saying pray, be bold enough to pray out loud. Timid prayers get timid answers. Make your request known to the Lord. I'm hoping that from what we talked about today that there would be at least the beginnings of hunger for the more that was talked about earlier. That, that each of us would expand in our hunger for the great harvest that this Lamb of God is worthy of. That we would see together Africa shall be saved that we shall see nations, entire nations yielding to this Christ. But to do that, we've got to see differently. We've got to lift up our eyes and look the way he looks to see what he sees. Because he started this whole thing by saying, unless you're born again, you cannot see. You have the capacity to see the way he sees. It's in your nature because of your conversion. Draw upon that now, and I want you to pray. I want you to lift your voices with mine. Let's pray, and then I'm going to pray over you at the very end. But lift your voices. <clears throat> pray with, in the Spirit, pray with the understanding. Do both. Keep praying. We want an anointing equal to what we see, the truth that we see. The fields are white under harvest. Just a moment longer. Just, just push into it just a little bit more. Now I want you to pray for South Africa to be saved. And if you come from another country, I want you to lift your voices and pray for this land. Pray for this people. 
Lift your voices, look on the fields, see them as ready for harvest. See the nations as ready for harvest. Father, I ask that you would just deepen the encounters that we have with you, the kind that just wake us up, the kind that changes how we think, how we live, how we see, but I ask also for the subtle things that even happen in the night while we sleep that we're not aware of, that just at every turn there would be just the increase the increase of experiencing the depth of your love that changes us and transforms us. Lord, I pray for this company of people that together we would see the greatest harvest, the greatest harvest, the greatest harvest, that in our lifetime we would see nations come before you and yield to the name Jesus. God, this is our cry. We pray this. So I'm asking that there would be a gift, a release of the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that you'd open our eyes to see. We pray what Paul prayed in Ephesians 1, that wisdom and revelation would be released to us as a gift in the knowledge of him. I pray this, that you would be exalted in all the earth. We long for the day where the entire globe is covered, blanketed with your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You feeling full? So should we just scrap lunch then? Yeah. Can we just appreciate what the Lord has just been releasing over us and over our nation and just say thank you to Bill.